Chan 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 Hey guys, welcome back to another video. For those who don't know, my name is Brian, and uh, I've been making a lot of Ukraine war videos lately, and so I've been diving into a lot of different Telegram channels for both direct information from both Russia and the Ukrainian side ones. And uh, also I've just listened to countless experts as they've been uh, putting out YouTube videos and uh, wherever else I can find them. And uh, what's weird is when I look at the mainstream media narratives and what they're talking about, it is not matching up at all with what the uh, troops are saying on the ground and what, what people like Seymour Hersh, the Pulitzer Prize journalist and uh, former U.S. Uh, colonels and all sorts of people are all in agreement and it's not in alignment with the mainstream media narrative. So the goal of this video is to save you guys a lot of time. That way you guys don't have to go and spend countless hours like I did researching and researching to find the truth. This video will contain information from retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas McGregor, former U.N. Weapons Inspector and Marine Corps Intelligence Officer Scott Ritter, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hersh, former U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency member and Putin expert Rebecca Koffler. So many of you are going to be hearing a lot of information you have not heard yet. And... Um, Basically, the Western media has a monopoly on information, and they promote a certain narrative, and then they tear down another narrative. And in this case, the torn down narrative is what you're about to hear about, and uh, it really fits this Plato quote from a long time ago, but it's just as relevant today. Here it is. Those who are able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture will never be understood let alone believed by the masses. And what determines culture these days? A big portion of it comes from the information that we're getting on the news and from mainstream media. So a lot of this information, I'm saying don't trust me on it. Research it yourself. You'll hear the same stuff right out of their mouths. And that's why I'm wearing this USA hat. You know, the country's not perfect. There's no perfect country out there. I like to fight for making it better as well. And that's about it. So let's jump on into it. So starting over the past few weeks, a new massive Russian invasion is happening. About 700,000 Russian troops are surrounding Ukraine. And between 250,000 of them to 300,000 of them are on the ground combat forces. So those are the ones that are going to be going in to the front lines, clearing out buildings, being in the... the biggest danger basically there's one group to the north of kiev and uh, two to the east so russia's likely goal is to destroy all bridges shut down all the rail lines and to basically end the Zelensky regime that is unless they surrender first or have a negotiated peace in some way and uh, so hopefully the peace will come before what's about to come with the military invasion uh, before it gets the full-scale invasion at least it's been happening for weeks but they've actually been mainly launching artillery and the casualties are high we're going to get to that right now russia has another stated goal of denazifying ukraine i remember a year ago when the war first happened when i heard that i'm like oh that's that's crazy. That's nuts. That's insane. It's Ukrainian people. There's no Nazis there. But there's actually a lot more truth to that. So don't believe me. Check it out on uh, DuckDuckGo. Don't use Google because they've been suppressing the sources you need to see. And do that for any controversial topic. That's the only way to get the truth. Uh, also research the Minsk agreements and the Donbass war. And uh, that was years ago, I believe it was 2013 or 14, 
when they signed an agreement, but uh, many of these Nazi types were attacking uh, Russians who live in the east of Ukraine. So the early parts of this invasion are going to see Russia taking over the eastern part of Ukraine first. That's the first step, according to these experts. If there is no surrender by Zelensky and the Ukrainians, then Russia will attempt to take the entire country and then have two to three years of military uh, rule where they will be in the pro longer process of denazifying the entire country. So I'm going to look at in this video how likely is that to happen well how has it gone so far and that's where the shocking stats start to come out uh, both sides have good reason to exaggerate their death and casualty numbers and to uh, exaggerate the enemies as being higher and theirs as lower these experts like uh, McGregor Colonel McGregor and Scott Ritter are given numbers like this. Now here are the death numbers, not casualty numbers, death numbers from Scott Ritter. He actually says, for comparison, uh, say the U.S. was in Vietnam for, on the ground, boots on the ground for about 10 years. He says we lost 58,000 guys dead, not casualties. Ukraine, which is about the size of Texas, lost in just under a year 157,000 to over 300,000 and about about Ritter he, as a weapons inspector he feels like the US screwed him over and so as he's talking that's a long story so as he's talking it's like a little bit too pro-Russia and so I think he's exaggerating and so those higher numbers of up to 300,000 it's probably near 200,000 if that uh, but you know the Ukraine will deny it but um, look at the screen right now I'll show you the images of the Ukrainian cemeteries near Bakhmut like I did in my previous video 75 percent of all casualties come from Russian artillery uh, remember casualties are injured dead sick desertion captured or missing according to Ritter 10 Ukrainians are killed for every one Russian lost. I mean that. I mean I'm going over numbers here, but it's important to humanize this. I mean, that's a, a father, a son, a family member for each one of those. I mean that's a crazy ratio. So to put this into perspective, Russia is also losing a very high rate of people still. On a weekly time frame, Russia is losing men at a rate of three times that that the USA did in Vietnam so it's been devastating on both sides and it's a tragedy for both sides for sure what this is is a war of attrition where both sides are trying to grind each other down where they're forcing each other to lose as many men as possible and to make them use their resources their military equipment as much as possible so in wars of attrition it comes down to who's got the stronger war industry backing them and, of course, who has more troops? Russia is far larger than Ukraine, and there are currently no countries that are officially giving troops to help balance that equation a little bit. I say officially because there are Americans and British and uh, so a bunch in there, but they're doing that on an individual level, and they just traveled there and did it without their state sanctioning it. So if Russia is actually killing 10 Ukrainians, for one Russian lost and it's a much much larger country and a year into this war they have another 700,000 that are now invading so the figures that I've been seeing are that the Ukrainian military size was about 700,000 to start now there are less than 250,000 and I mean as far as how many dead and wounded that is a crazy figure all right, and here's where the big advantage is for Russia. They're able to use 10 artillery shells for every one that Ukraine is able to use. I mean, that is incredible considering 75% of all casualties to Ukraine come from artillery. Russia has been shooting 60,000 of them per day, but leading up to this new invasion, they actually slowed down a little bit 
and now it's way above 60,000. Nobody knows exactly where it's at for sure, but they were uh, saving some so that way they were able to use it for this invasion. And here is the big problem for Ukraine. They're going to run out of artillery. NATO, the head of NATO just came out saying they're going to run out by summer. So the only thing that was allowing Ukraine to keep Russia at bay was this artillery, is this artillery, and that's about to be gone. NATO has no way of replenishing this. They've been using their own stockpiles, and that's running low, and they still need enough to defend their own countries. So the current population of Ukraine is somewhere between 18 million and 22 million. Before the war started, it was at about 43 million. Over 10 million left. 4 million live under Russia rule in the East Donbass region, happily. Now, the Russian population before the war was 143 million. So around 143 million versus 20 million people is what this war is coming down to. It does come down to economies in a war of attrition. And that's why, if you look into history, why the U.S. was uh, firebombing Japan. The justification was that's their war industry. And unfortunately, the war industry was mixed in with residential neighborhoods. And I made a whole video on this. It's on this channel as well. So check that out at the top of here. So it's a war of attrition. Ukraine has no way of attacking the war industry of Russia. And Russia is decimating the war industry, whatever they had in Ukraine. And uh, NATO right now is incapable of replenishing the artillery. So it's looking very, very bleak. Also, more videos have been coming out showing these uh, military recruiters who are basically recruiting by force, according to what I've been reading. Uh, people are running away from them or hiding from them and... Uh, there's teenagers who are now in uniform, as you saw at the beginning of this video. They're, they're recruiting teenagers, people who usually would be too old to join the military, and it's, it's a real tragedy. So, as you would expect, the morale is low right now for Ukraine, but in the media and from what's coming out of Zelensky's mouth, you would not know it whatsoever. Here's a few quotes that actually made it into, into Western media. And uh, it's from a soldier in Bakhmut, which is, uh, I made my previous video, uh, the second uh, Ukraine compilation type video was all about the uh, city of Bakhmut. It's in the Donbass in the far east of the country, and it's been the most severe battlegrounds for months. So... A Ukrainian soldier in Bakhmut said half of the here's a direct quote half of the people have already died there is no artillery the situation is very bad there is no fighting spirit and this is from western media there's also a US retired marine fighting alongside Ukrainians and he says they're calling Bakhmut the meat grinder and on the front life expectancy is about 4 hours four hours is that Russian artillery sounds like it's coming in and the media is not telling you about it the media is not showing you the Ukrainian uh, cemeteries here and I'm just here telling you the truth it sucks for America I'm pro-America that's why I'm wearing this hat for this video too just to make that crystal clear uh, but you know it's I value the truth more than anything so I'll just tell you as it is it's coming down to a numbers game, a war of attrition in a numbers game. Uh, these, what little tanks have been promised to Ukraine, I've been hearing that NATO is fracturing and they're scared of having whatever they send over there being captured or destroyed by the Russians and studied, leaving their own countries to be less defensible uh, later on if there is a Russian invasion happening, which I don't believe it would happen based on a lot of stuff that's coming up in this video too. So just to give you perspective on this artillery problem for Ukraine, according to Scott Ritter, 
Ukraine fires more in a day than we produce in a month. And I think by we, he must have meant all of NATO or possibly just the U.S. I wasn't sure. He didn't uh, make that crystal clear. But uh, he says 12 days equals 100,000 rounds or shells, which is our production rate annually. And so they're running out of ammo. They're running out of uh, artillery shells and rounds. He also says Russia is in a war footing, meaning 24-7 their factories are pumping out more and more and more. And so they have no shortages right now. They're preparing for a multi-year war. They're, like I think it was another three or four years at least. Ukraine has been trying to keep up with Russia's artillery pace. But it's impossible to sustain. And so now the U.S. is uh, telling them and they're encouraging Ukraine to learn these more modern tactics that even the U.S. uses where it deals with unexpected movements and shifting around more, maybe creating openings. I, I'm not a total expert on it, but that's what I was reading. So because of the supply problems, maybe you, Ukraine will adjust, but that also sounds more risky. They're going to be running out into the open, opening, trying to uh, evade Russian artillery and making themselves big targets. It seems like this is an impossible situation. Also, NATO has been taking some of what they have in their stockpiles, and uh, they've been giving them to Ukraine. But, of course, they don't want to run too low in case Russia does decide to keep pushing into other countries or even threatening their own countries. So, this is the Russian tactic. They've been using artillery. 75% of all casualties on Ukraine come from this artillery. And this way, they're minimizing risk to Russian troops and they've been devastating Ukraine troops. After using artillery for a long time, then once... The troops are nice and softened up on, U on the Ukraine side. Then Russia feels more confident to move and creep forward a little bit. And this is what they've been in, uh, doing throughout the war. Not the beginning, but once they learn their lesson and stop being overly aggressive, that's what they adapted. Russia has been criticized for not being able to capture any more ground in the east. But I think they realize it's a war of attrition. They have their factories pumping out everything they need while there are major shortages for Ukraine. They can just wait them out. Once Ukraine runs out of what they need, Russia will just steamroll. It's not going to be, it's going to be barely any resistance. So for the next year or so, time is the enemy for Ukraine. Much of the pledged weapons and supplies from NATO and the U.S. were needed yesterday, and they will not arrive on time. The wait for large caliber ammo is now 28 months which is up from a year. Scott Ritter predicts that this war will be over by early August. He admits he could be wrong still. Some strange wild card stuff could happen. At this stage for Ukraine, with many people in the U.S. Uh, tiring, as well as uh, many members of NATO, behind the scenes at least, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with this war. This was not their war to fight. NATO was supposed to be a defensive pact. And how many more billions and billions and are you going to give? And uh, now there's the risk that any tank you give, any jet you give, any uh, equipment, it will likely fall into Russian hands. So how can Ukraine win at, in this situation? I think that we have to reevaluate what winning is to to have war i think both sides are automatically losers and they're mainly do it just for future uh benefits i guess you could say and it, uh, unfortunately a lot of the uh, war industry makes immediate profits and they control governments this is what the military industrial complex is you look at uh, president eisenhower's uh, farewell speech that's what he was warning about. And it's gone unchecked. The United States has an issue with it. And I'm sure most countries in the world do. And uh, it's probably stronger than ever, too. Making, I mean, I'm sure their business is booming during this war. Having NATO join into this war against Russia would not benefit anyone. Especially, everybody knows at this point that if nukes start flying, the world is over. 
and nuclear winter will happen. The uh, crops will no longer uh, grow. We're going to face starvation. I mean, that is absolutely worst case scenario for both sides. If NATO, led by the U.S., has a direct confrontation with Russia. So if Ukraine fights to the last man and uh, every troop becomes a casualty, it still won't change the outcome either. It reminds me of during World War II, after the Battle of Stalingrad, where the Russians defeated the Nazis there, it was pretty obvious to the world that the Nazis had lost. Hitler became some reject, quiet, isolated, miserable character, and they still refused to uh, surrender to save the lives of so many people. So the outcome was already decided, and... Hitler did not surrender, and it caused countless unnecessary deaths. Maybe they could have prevented, because uh, the angry uh, Soviet troops, once they got to Germany, they started raping, and it was really horrible. And that was one of the worst parts about the war, because these women had to live on with that. Most of them lived after having these monsters come in and doing that. I mean, there were plenty of good Soviet troops as well who were trying to stop it as well. Russia, to this day, denies that it happened, but the world knows it did. So it's looking like there's no possibility for Ukraine to win at this point, and it's going to save countless lives if they work out a negotiated peace. The best case scenario, which I guess you could call it a win in a way, is this negotiated peace. Uh, Germany and France are now openly calling for it as of yesterday, uh, say as soon as possible. China is also saying that. Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself, why would Putin allow Zelensky to exist? It, I'm sure he would like to get rid of him entirely because he sees Zelensky and the Nazis over there. I'm not saying Zelensky's a Nazi, but they're both there. And uh, he sees them as like snakes in the grass, I guess, where would you let your children and your families go where you knew there were poisonous snakes ready to strike you at any minute? So perhaps he would let the Zelensky regime control maybe Kiev and uh, Odessa and everything west of there, up to the Polish border. There are benefits to both sides for allowing the Zelensky regime to continue to exist. Uh, having a buffer state would actually help to prevent accidental future conflicts between NATO and Russia. And remember, nobody benefits from the head-to-head -head battle between nuclear superpowers and that's why Russia is also being super careful right now in this war to not attack NATO so uh, Putin actually did put out a warning recently about uh, if any missiles or any interference came from Poland that interfered with uh, his efforts in Ukraine and uh, he said they will strike back and uh, hopefully the U.S. and NATO decide it's not worth the risk, and both of these superpowers remain separated. But there is a chance Zelensky could try to fake something just to try to drag NATO into it. The similar to what happened, uh, what was it, a couple months ago, where uh, anti-aircraft uh, missile or whatever they got on there uh, was launched. Where was it? Oh, into Poland about. Uh, my, a couple miles in or whatever and uh turns out it was a ukrainian one and they were trying to blame russia and Zelensky was trying to drag nato in so it's possible for that kind of stuff to happen a lot of major problems can be avoided with the modern technology and communications that we have today because putin made it known what his actions would be by attacking poland if missiles and stuff are coming out of poland that makes it less likely that NATO will decide to launch any missiles or anything. It reminds me of World War I, which a good part of it could have been avoided if England would have made their actions, what would they do, uh, clear ahead of time to Germany. Germany needed to invade France, and so they needed to do it quick, and the best way to do so was to go swing around through Belgium up to the northwest-ish, and uh, 
that way it was a less defended border. But Belgium didn't like that. The British had Belgium's back and they dragged uh, them into the war, the, the British. Uh, it was like less than a week before that they, they decided not to even join World War I. And yet they joined. A part of the reason why Russia started this war in the manner that they did with a sort of skeleton crew trying to go directly to assassinate Zelensky, uh, it's because Putin sees this as a civil war. He sees them all as one people and he does not want to rain down a lot of destruction on people that he sees are basically the same. So because he tried using a skeleton crew to invade, the West and NATO, led by the U.S., saw that as weakness in the Russians. And then the money started fl uh, flooding into Ukraine. But before that, they thought that Ukraine was going to fall like in a, a week or two or whatever as well. Everybody did. Nobody realized the fighting spirit that Ukraine had in them. And they, they were saying, like all these military experts were saying, that the Ukrainians fight more fiercely than... Uh, anyone in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria and so the Russians at first were completely unprepared for them. Also there is a lot of Russian uh, historical buildings and culture there that they don't want to have to destroy. So for that reason that will add to Putin possibly taking a, a good or giving Ukraine a good deal and a negotiated peace. Another reason why Putin might want to go with a negotiated peace and allow Zelensky to survive in his regime as well would be that uh, city warfare is some of the most unpredictable and difficult conditions there are for the invading army. These destroyed buildings provide a lot of hiding spots. It looks like nobody could be hiding in a certain area. Next thing you know, you're getting shot at from there. And uh, it's very unpredictable. A lot of Russians will die if that happens. And so hopefully he will allow them to surrender and allow Zelensky to exist. There's a lot of benefits to this. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I'm sure my idea is flawed. And I'm, I would like to hear from you guys about why it's flawed in the comments. But it's at least a decent starting point. Uh, I'm sure Zelensky would be forced to allow... Uh, Russia to keep Crimea, which they've controlled for many years now already, and uh, the Donbass region, and maybe the whole east of Ukraine. And uh, so let me know what you guys think in the comments. I look forward to learning and hearing from you guys as well. Uh, but basically, Ukraine is in a bad spot, and it's in the best interest of the entire world if this ends immediately. So... But also I want to just highlight, we've been talking about a lot of numbers and strategies and stuff. Remember, everybody who is engaged in this war, they're losing family members and friends. And so it's a tragedy on both sides. Both sides have already lost. And uh, yeah, they're losing their fathers, their sons. Many kids will go without their parents for the rest of their lives. And so the pain of this war, even if it ends tomorrow or today, it, the pain of this war is just beginning so be sure to keep them in your thoughts and prayers and uh, if you can do anything that can make a dent in this world uh, I think we should do it like protesting against the war which I know uh, there was one scheduled in uh, Washington DC pretty soon we got to stop as Americans we need to stop giving our money to this lost cause in my opinion I know I, that's going to be controversial because what you guys see on the news is but look all the experts that I've been listening to anybody who doesn't have a reason to lie like being on a mainstream news program or uh, like being on CNN or even Fox has to go along with this same thing uh, anyone who doesn't have a reason to lie and gives it to you straight this is the conclusion that they're coming to. I just, right before I started filming this, I was watching Seymour Hirsch talk about it as well. Like, it's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, of course, I want, for selfish reasons, the United States to be doing great and everything it does. But in this case, can't we allow Russia to have like a tiny sphere of influence outside of its border? Uh, 
I know a lot of the mainstream narrative is that Putin is uh, irrational and crazy and insane and he's just going to keep taking every other country and he's rebuilding the Soviet Union. But those like uh, Koffler, who I just mentioned, she actually says, after basing her whole career on studying Putin, she's like, he's not suicidal. He's not crazy. He's a very rational guy. And I have a feeling that uh, she is correct. So I watched a little mini documentary on Putin, and he started in life as basically a nobody. He wasn't uh, like in the Bush family or one of these secret societies that get you to run for president. He actually tried reaching out to the KGB when he was uh, a young man, and the KGB said, don't ever contact us again, get lost. Yeah, maybe you can join us in the future, but your options now, I think it was, to join the military or go to school. So eventually Putin got his uh, chance. He got in and the rest is history. The reason why Putin got to the top spot he's in now is that he was super competent. He was intelligent and uh, he impressed the right people because he was very rational and reasonable and he had balls. There was some really dicey moments where the Soviet Union wasn't even answering his his uh phone call as they were starting to collapse and he had to act quick and he burned Russian papers and he, and he was in like this embassy thing surrounded by protesters that could barge down the door uh, at any moment and get a hold of papers so he was in this really crazy situation and he thought quick he, his leadership uh, really protected Russia for years to come and he impressed the right people raised through the ranks Next thing you know, this nobody is one of the closest advisors to uh, the president at the time. So his story is pretty impressive, and it reminds me a lot of Napoleon's story. He was like this weird outsider with a strange accent, and through dedication and hard work and, and being good at his job, Napoleon rose to the top. Same with Putin. There's a reason they don't show you uh, Putin's direct speeches on our televisions where with a translator and everything. It's super hard to find a Putin speech because they don't want you to see what the man has to say. Because if you, if you actually look at what he's saying, most of it is actually uh, reasonable. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I hope the U.S. wins and everything we do still, but I encourage you guys to go beyond the mainstream news that uh, the mainstream news has no interest but to keep you calm and supporting the war. And they'll t tell you only the worst of the worst about Russia and Putin. They won't tell you this, a sliver of, of good about them. So once I heard other people's opinions on Putin, my fear of nuclear war went way down compared to where they were at the beginning of the war. Because when this war first happened, I'm, all you're hearing is, Putin's in, insane. He's going to kill us all. He, oh, he just wants to rebuild his empire. And, and he he's just going to be irrational and crazy and insane. And he's murderous as hell. And that's all you would hear. And so I highly encourage you guys to look at Putin's life story. And uh, I really think he is a, a rational guy who does care about his country and his family and everybody. Uh, the one wild card, though, I would say is there was a U.S. intelligence report that he was battling some kind of cancer. That report came out, I think, about four or five months, maybe a little later into the war. And uh, it was talking about, I think it was the two or three months prior to that. And uh, he disappeared after the invasion began. He uh, got out of the public light and the U.S. intelligence report said he was getting some cancer treatments. So if he does have some kind of cancer or something that starts affecting his mind, maybe then we have a, a real concern. But it seems like he does have uh, other generals and leadership around him that are helping him to war game his, his uh, plans out and everything. So let's hope that cancer situation stays as calm as possible over there well i hope this video helped you guys to understand the big picture again don't believe me go ahead and just do your own research look into uh, all these claims and uh please be sure to hit that like button share this with other people 
and uh yeah subscribe and i'll be making videos for years to come right now i've been making a lot of war videos but basically whatever i'm interested in just learning about the world philosophy history whatever it is i'm going to take you guys along for the ride and uh yeah that's about it so you guys have a good day or a night memento mori let's hope for peace asap